right, I'm here with Gerald Casali, founding member and lead, uh, uh, co-lead on Devo. Co yeah, co-lead with Devo. Yes, great to see you, Gerald. Good to see you. And of course, I'm wearing my Devo shirt, so I'll, yep. I'll fanboy out. I like that one. <laughs> I like that one too. I got it actually at your last uh, Desert Days show, probably, well, about a year ago now. All right. Yeah. I think that was available there exclusively, actually. I think so. And that yeah. was a great show, a great show. And unfortunately, now there's no touring, there's no playing. But great to see who, you. Who knew? Who knew that would be the last show allowed, huh? Well, and that gets into if there were ever a time for Devo, this is that time. Well, <laughs> it, the times are more devolved than we could have even projected ever. Absolutely. So, so Gerald, first, before we get into some of the things, we are now four days out to the election. And yeah. we have today is day one for early voting in California. And right. what are your thoughts, uh, Devo thoughts, as you look back or look at where we are today and, and where you see things heading? You know, I realized that I was like the allegory of the cave uh, where the, you know, it's like the sheep that we don't know we're in the cave and we're reacting to shadows on the wall. Luckily, even Devo was so naive 40 years ago as to how things really work that we thought there was an actual democracy functioning and that there were just some bad apples trying to, you know, strike blows to it and try to bring it down somehow. And that uh, ultimately uh, affirmative action on the part of people could stop that. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I have to laugh now. I'm embarrassed that uh, because of what I know now, how silly and naive that was. Yeah, but you're very much ahead of your time in many ways too, because here we are, right? Here we are. So. This goes back to really, if ever there were time for Devo, this is that time. And yeah, so I mean, there is no democracy, by the way, people. There, there just isn't. There's not a functioning democracy. And when you start really reading the rules, how they work, it kind of never was. This was, we all had our heads in the sand. Uh, it's a republic, but it's a, at best a representative democracy, but not so representative. So you have states all having two senators each, even though one state has 1 60th of the population of California where our votes don't matter. So first of all, it is not one man, one vote. If it were, we would have a functioning democracy, but we don't have that. We have, for instance, right now, 51 or 52 senators who represent 15 million less people than the minority senators, okay? But they have disproportionate power. Mm -hmm. and that's written in to the constitution. And then you have the electoral college that further exacerbates inequality because rather than apportion votes, let's say in a state where 60% vote Republican, 40% vote Democrat, where you could then divide up the electoral votes proportionately, they don't do that. It's winner take all. Yeah. So suddenly 40% of the people don't matter. Now, that didn't used to be such a huge problem because it wasn't rigged like it is today. So the, the hilarious, you know, preposterous truth that is funny here is that Trump claims the election is rigged. Well, he's absolutely correct, but it's rigged in his favor by these rules and the electoral college and by what's happened in the courts. So I'll, that, I'll end my spiel there. Well, so no, we're, I... we're fighting an uphill battle. We're all fighting an uphill battle for those who actually believe in democracy and would like that to see that be operational. Good luck. And, and that's not to mention even the US Supreme Court, where now oh. we just have the addition. So now we have the conservatives in the six to three majority, despite the fact that the views that re are represented are in the minority also. 
significantly on certain issues in particular. So that gets to your point further. Well, that's right. Because until the last two Republican administrations, uh, the Supreme Court had not been effectively politicized as a, as a tool of the governing party, right? Yeah. It actually did function as the third rail in government as it was supposed to, almost like a nonpartisan referee uh, upholding the principles of law, which was brilliant. That's gone. They, they nakedly and in front of everybody, they didn't try to hide it, in plain sight, they packed the court. They, they accused Democrats of wanting to court pack. Well, they packed the court. So the court now is a tool. It's a corrupt tool of the right wing. Um, it's so frightening. And like, as you mentioned, we are now under rule of a tyrannical minority. This is not the rule of the will of the people. This is not the majority sentiment at all. We are being told by a minority how to act and what to do and what the law is. This is completely against the very fabric of the American revolution and democracy, completely. So what is Devo gonna do about it? Yeah, exactly. Well, if it was up to me, Devo would be doing a lot uh, about it. And we, we had, you know, still a, uh, uh, a voice in the public, right? We had, we had a voice in the marketplace and we could have this year really been out there at a pivotal point in history with the 40th anniversary of freedom of choice to actually bring this all up again in a cohesive manner. And despite my, you know, partner's reticence at doing anything Devo, he had, he had in, as of November 19, uh, committed to a slate of big festivals and concerts uh, and all that goes with it, with uh, press and everything. And we had worked with AEG and we had come up with a slate of them and signed off on them. And they were all going to begin in May of 2020. And we all know what happened. Yeah, no, it's such a shame because like you said, it is the 40th anniversary. And that gets us to what I'll, we'll be focusing on today, the story behind the song. But there was gonna be this great show in May of this year, maybe even earlier in Los Angeles, that was just one of the shows. And that was a cruel world, absolutely. Cruel world. Cruel world. How cruel did it become? How quickly? Yes, yes, that's so true. But in any event, let's hope. Let's hope it comes back. I'm going to remain positive, but <laughs> I'm going to try my best to remain positive. You're a positive guy. Well, I try to be. And your music despite the fact that it's about de-evolution, nonetheless, it's like uplifting in so many ways. And I wanna talk about that today. So this is, as I told you, Gerald, um, the second in my series of the story behind the song. And okay. where we know, uh, many of us know about at least some of the main themes about Devo and how it got started and then followed you throughout your great career and continuing to this day and going to your shows and obviously buying merch. But getting in deeper about songs themselves and the story behind those songs. And the first right. one was about Pink Floyd's classic, Have a Cigar. And that in a very little known, some know, but in a very little known story of lore and rock and roll, it wasn't Pink Floyd singing that song, it was Roy Harper. So I recently right. interviewed Roy Harper for Consequence of Sound right. and, and Roy, it was, it was amazing. He I read that. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. yeah. And he talked about the story behind that song, but also about one of his great classic folk songs because he was a folk singer. So what I tried to do is I want to talk about one major hit from the band and then one that's a little bit deeper cut. Right. You hear the story behind it. And right. so let's first start with, um, let's start with Whip It because Whip It is perhaps your best known song. Right. I, I, there are so many great ones, but perhaps it's your best known song. It's the 40th anniversary of it. So tell us a little bit about how that came to be and the inspiration sure. and everything about it. Sure, because I mean, obviously with that, we lucked out because we finally got air, airplay, radio airplay. And 
And until then, you know, Devo were really the pioneers that got scalped where the prevailing aesthetics and politics of FM radio uh, programmers were that well, Devo was verboten, you know, what the hell is this stuff? We want rock and roll, you know? So they were, you know, the, 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 those stations were, were controlled by guys that were still mired in late 60s, early 70s, um, rock and roll lore, right? And, and that involved, you know, the independent promoters with the drugs and the prostitutes and the, you know, satin record company ball jackets and the, the long hair and the mutton chops and the whole thing. And so Devo comes along in the midst of that and they're like just so off put and so disgusted like, what the hell is this? These guys, they're all clean shaven with short hair and they're wearing these yellow plastic suits and they're talking about de-evolution, like get them out of here, right? Yeah. But by 1980, obviously what had happened is there was a sea change, there was a shift and radio was coming around and people understood that this new music that had been so, you know, uh, whatever the word is, rejected or, you know, become a pariah. Uh, it, it wasn't going away. In fact, it was getting better and there were more and more groups and there was something building and it was a big deal. So when we were uh, recording Freedom of Choice, of course we were feeling all that and aware of all that. And we were in a rehearsal studio in Hollywood, California, uh, in 1979, you know, rented a tiny little place on Cole Avenue in Hollywood. You know, it was a dump, of course. But we'd go there every day. We'd show up around one, one in the afternoon and, and work until late, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, and then grab a late dinner. And we were, of course, um, young and motivated and still this functioning unit, this, this collaboration where Everybody was excited to be there and everybody was excited to, to work on these songs. And um, we had basically um, exhausted our previous catalog of songs that we had written for four or five years in our um, basement and garage days in, in, in Akron, Ohio. And, uh, and now we were interested in, in moving forward to the next phase of Devo. And, and of course, we just as artists and musicians, we were no longer interested in just repeating what we had done with the same sounds and the same beats and the same type of lyrics. We, we had new ideas. That's what Devo was. We were experimental. We were moving, changing artists. So we were being driven by this group idea that we all agreed on to um, be Devo's version of R&B influenced electronic music. That was as hilarious as it sounds because nobody would listen to Freedom of Choice and go, oh yeah, R&B, <laughs> you know, they wouldn't. But there was basic agreements, like we were going to change the kinds of beats we were uh, going to play to. They were gonna be more danceable coming from funk and R&B. And I was going to play a mini Moog bass, not a bass guitar because we were very influenced by songs by Stevie Wonder hmm. and, and uh, other that groups. Interesting. I know, it's very interesting. Nobody'd know, right? And, and we were very, we loved uh, the Gap Band and we loved, uh, who, who did You Dropped a Bomb on Me? Is oh yeah, no, that's a great song. Um, I think, it, isn't that the Gap Band? That may be the Gap Band, we love I think that. it's the Gap Band. What's that? I said, we loved them yeah. and, and we loved the Ohio players and, and we loved early Prince. We were listening to Prince. My hometown, Minneapolis. Oh my God, Prince. He really did it for us. We actually saw him at some place that had been a roller rink at the corner of La Cienega Boulevard and Santa Monica Boulevard in 1979 when he still hadn't really broken through, but Warners had signed him and we were invited to the show down there at, 
I can't remember the n name of the place. It had been a roller rink, but they turned it into a uh, CVS you know, drugstore. Yeah, food. Yeah, it was where the drugstore is now. Food, concerts. So there was a dance floor, but then there were all these, you know, tiered seats where you could be eating food and watching. And Prince comes out, of course, in a uh, Burberry beige trench, trench coat, bikini underpants, garter belts and hose, and six inch high heels and nothing else. And he starts doing the songs from Controversy before great. it was released. Yeah, great album. And we were just, as artists, we were blown away. We were jealous. It was amazing. And he was scaring everybody, of course. <laughs> but we were just listening to what he was doing, and it was so good, right? It was just so good. That's fascinating. So anyway. Yeah, I th that's fascinating, because I don't think it's obvious to people that Devo would be inspired and influenced by Prince. No, I, I realize that. But Bob Mothersbaugh and I, in particular, were really big fans of historical R&B that was coming out of Detroit in the mid 60s through early 70s. Because back in Ohio, one of the main AM stations that came through was out of Detroit. And we heard all that stuff early when most of the country wasn't. And so, you know, we were big fans of stuff like working in a coal mine or, you know, uh, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles with uh, James Jamerson on bass, like Tears of a Clown. Mm -hmm. So all that was being factored into this music we were writing. And uh, I loved learning how to play Moog bass and what that was doing to the kind of songs we wrote because I was interacting with Alan and Alan was laying down more, you know, two, four funky uh, uh, dance beats. And we were very excited. That was, that was it, you know, that nobody would expect this from Devo. So long before we picked Robert Marigaleff to produce our record, because he had worked with Stevie Wonder, we were already doing this stuff. And that was the reason, uh, that was the reason that we chose Bob Margaleff. And it worked out because he, you know, he was the perfect guy to record music that was based on a more dry drum set with funky synthesizer lines and uh, as on bass. But just backing up what we, we, what we would do every day then in 1979, in this rehearsal studio on Cole Street in uh, uh, Hollywood was share everything. Mark and I kept sketchbooks and lyric books. You know, we were both artists. That's, how, that's our background. And we would bring in and share anything we had come up with creatively. So we'd lay them out on a table and anybody in the band could look at what we'd been trying to write or what we'd been thinking. And Mark at that time had uh, set up a, a rudimentary recording system in his bedroom so that he could play sketches and riffs onto a uh, cassette machine and then mix it down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he would start bringing in things that we didn't create together in the coal rehearsal hall to, for us to listen to if we liked something. And, you know, I would diligently listen to everything he brought in, in addition to him listening to everything that I would play in the studio, like here's an idea for a song here, here. And Whip It came about from four different cassette tapes at different times over a two week period. And they were each sketches that, that embody pieces of the composition that became Whip It, but they were in different BPMs, different instrumentation. And in fact, the chorus to Whip It was a piece he had done just with a keyboard running through some uh, like harmonizer detuner. And it was in a different time signature than, than two four. But that's the part that became do do down, do do. 
down, 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 down. But it was going down, 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 down. It was almost just like um, almost just like abstract, you know, classical music meets Schoenberg or something. But you know, there were things in each of them that I liked, and I started saying, "Why don't we combine these things over a central beat?" And uh, Alan came up with what became the famous Whip It beat, which we thought at this time was just so cool and strange. We we just loved it because I mean, it didn't really sound like any other beat that anybody was doing because it was kind of like jazz meets disco is what it was. And only Alan could do a beat like that because he came from a jazz background and he was super accomplished drummer before Devo. And he had, he had an amazing metronomic feel. That guy was the human metronome. Huh. So he laid down this beat and we all liked it so much that then started putting the parts from these four different tapes together into one composition. So did he, so he heard the pieces and then he created the beat? Uh, I'm not sure Alan heard those pieces. Uh, he just created this beat um, anyway. But once I heard it, and Mark loved it, then it was like, let's use that beat to put these four pieces of music together like this, right? And I had these lyrics I had written already that I, for six months, I had no use for it because I thought, well, they're so strange, nobody's gonna like them and they're not rock and roll. And I wrote them only because I'd been reading um, Thomas Pynchon, Pynchon's book, uh, Gravity's Rainbow, and in it, he created all these poems and limericks that were satires of American exceptionalism, like Horatio Alger, you're number one, you're special, it's only you, you can do it, you know. And it's this whole, you know, the whole propaganda of America that keeps people going in capitalism, right? And I, I thought they were so funny and so clever, you know, I'm laughing out loud alone in my bedroom reading this book. <laughs> Yeah, I thought, I want to make one of those. I'm going to make a Thomas Pynchon kind of limerick. And I wrote Whip It, like in one night in my bedroom. It just, so how does that, how does that come to you? Do you have a typical process when you, when lyrics come to you or no? No, no, no. The, the main process was write them down now because you're going to forget them in the morning. Hmm. You know, that, that was the truth. Mm -hmm. You come up with these brilliant ideas and then you think there's no way you're going to forget that. And then you do. It's like a dream where you have this amazing poignant dream and it's so significant to you and so potentially life changing. And then you wake up and you start getting interrupted by, you know, your housemate, your girlfriend, phone calls. Three hours later, it was like, what was that dream? And so much creativity is like a dream anyway, uh, because you're best when you get past the effort, the conscious effort, you know, the kind of constipated, forced logic effort of coming up with something. That's not creativity. Creativity usually comes in an inspirative moment, like boom, you know, it's the light bulb. And so you better get it some evidence of it, right? So anyway, that, so anyway, when, when, when we started putting these pieces together and everybody loved this composition so much, we started wanting to play it together. I went back to the Whippet lyrics and, you know, showed Mark and showed him, you know, hey, let's, I could sing this here, you know, and I could sing that there. And they just fit. Suddenly we had the right music for these lyrics that had no music previously. And the point of all this long drawn out story is that when you're a band that's collaborating freely, when there's no real hierarchical politics, and when you're sharing this information, great things can happen. 
that's when the best stuff gets made and people are on the same page. So nobody's resisting going, wait a minute. Well, I didn't write those lyrics, so we can't put them on there. Right. And yeah. that's how the fact that if you look at the Devo catalog of over 150 songs, 90% of them are 50, 50 collaborations between Mark and I, because we worked well together and almost without exception, the best songs were done that way. Well, I kind of think of you, it's, it's interesting because it is 50-50 when you look at your, all, all, your catalog of great songs. It's almost like you're the Lennon and McCarthy of New Wave. And, yeah, I would like to think that. I, yeah, but it, it, kind, you know, it's, it, but it's that kind of a collaboration where there was no need to parse out who did what. It was just, it was a team. Created. No, right. Because if you looked after the facts, so you don't up front. It's like people that worry about how will history view me up front? Well, that's ridiculous. You better just go do what you can do the best you can do it. And then you can figure that out later. So just write the good songs and then look back on them. And guess what? Oh, they were 50, 50. You know, you don't like start off with this has to be 50, 50 <laughs> because then you're in trouble. Then you're typical. You've become you know, Republican businessmen, not artists. Right. And, uh, and so what I, what I revere and respect and love in memory so much is that at that point in time, how Whip It Got Written was in the true spirit of Devo. Uh, excitement, openness, collaboration, uh, working together for the greater good. Like, we just want the best songs, right? Let's throw out the dumb stuff and what sucks. And we just want the best. Because like if the rest of the band wasn't into it, I knew that that means I went off on some tangent. Because regardless of who writes the stuff, the, the, real, the real, you know, uh, um, test is if people who didn't write it love it. <laughs> so. So speaking and, of and, and the band was all there, you know, they cooperated and collaborated in ways and, 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 and they did things that were so essential to the, to the recording of the song and the nuances of the details of the song that without them, those songs wouldn't sound like that. There's no way. Everybody was there. And, and they, in Devo, it wasn't like we had session guitar players. I mean, we couldn't even find a guitar player that was, you know, worth his salt that would touch what we were doing. They, they had no respect for it and you couldn't have talked him into it. We could have only had, you know, our brothers, Bob Mothersbaugh and Bob Casale doing this because they understood us and they trusted us. So they didn't think they were being made fun of or taken for a ride when we said, well, could you do something like this? And it's a ridiculous guitar line that no cool, <laughs> musician would ever play right because Devo was not cool well you were through being cool that's very we true were. that did, that was the joke right as if we ever were yeah that yeah. was the joke did you anyway uh, so Gerald did you know once you had caught that internal magic with the band you know and you recorded it did you feel that you had a hit on your hand no not at all but again, because Devo probably couldn't have written a hit on purpose if, if our lives depended on it. But what we did do as artists is only, only pursue things that we thought were really good, that we were proud of, right? So on a record, when you hear freedom of choice, you know, you as an audience may quickly make judgments about which songs are great and what are silly and what's not worked out enough or whatever. But he is, as you know, as damning as it may sound at the time, any song we put on there, we thought was really good, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't, we didn't like assign, this one's a hit, this one's a deep cut. We didn't think like that. It was just like, these are great. We're putting them on. We're putting them on this record. And of course, the record company searching desperately for a hit 
Because the other story here is that Freedom of Choice was going to be our last record. Warner Brothers sent an A&R man out to us in 1979 before we started recording any demos for Freedom of Choice. And we were playing a tour uh, supporting Duty Now for the Future, our second record. We were at the Palladium in New York City. And just before the show, our road manager is called into the green room and it's some guy from Warner's who I don't remember because he wasn't our regular a and man, but he was in the city. And they had this long discussion in there in a closed door. And then we're backstage getting our costumes on to start the show for the Duty Now for the Future concert. And this tour manager, Ron Stone, says, hey guys, um, you know, I was just in this conversation with so-and-so we go, yeah, what's going on there? He goes, well, bad news. He says, if this next record doesn't have a hit on it, it's your last record. Don't worry about the contract. They're going to breach it. And they're going to invite us to sue them. So they're not going forward with your five album deal because they don't like duty now for the future. So this is what the message we get before we go on stage. <laughs> And then, yeah, that's thank, thank you, record company. Oh, yeah. yeah. And thank, thank you, Ron Stone, for yeah, exactly. waiting until after the concert. Yeah. But uh, Devo had enough fight in them and enough disrespect for illegitimate authority that I think we went out and played with more intensity than ever that night. But then what, we, what our response was, of course, to this threat was, fuck it, we're just going to do everything we were just talking about doing among ourselves, which was this R&B influenced music with a Moog bass, like, hey, if they didn't like Duty Now for the Future, fuck them. Wait till they hear stuff that's more electronic with a, with a Moog synthesizer bass compared to the first two records. What would they think of that, right? So there was and, no, uh, so when you did that, it sounds like it was that a conscious reaction to that moment? No, just no, all it did is, is peak our resolve to do exactly what we'd been kind of talking about informally. Yeah, and do it on purpose. So it was like, okay, because we thought, oh, they'll really hate this because this is all this is a completely new direction for Devo. Like it'll piss off our cult members, it'll piss off the punks. We knew that. We knew that the, the hardcore people that are orthodox would would just go, what the hell? This isn't Devo, man. You know, where's the heavy rock and roll? You know. So did you have did. any did you have any fear about that? Like or did were you no not at all? It was more like, okay, we're gonna go down, let's go down in flames. That's what it was like. And that's in retrospect the only proper reaction an artist can have. Because yeah. obviously, you know, <laughs> there's risk in being creative. You know, I mean, really, did anybody, Jimi Hendrix, he releases Are You Experienced, the first record. If you, if you had told anybody six months previously, you know, with some kind of like surreptitious time warp, here's the music you're going to love. Here's the music you want to listen to and you won't be able to take off the turntable. They would have said, you're nuts. That shit is noise, right? Yeah. Well, guess what? He releases it and what happens? Every kid wears out the vinyl in the first month and he changes music forever and it explodes. You have to be willing to jump off the cliff or jump into the void, you know, like Luke Skywalker, you got to do mm -hmm. it. So we did it. And the only song that the record company focused on, because they were desperately searching for some reason to make money and not cut us from the roster, was Girl You Want. They decided Girl You Want was it. And that's where they put their marketing efforts. So they, it was their one last you know, peon to Devo, we're gonna go with Girl You Want. And they put 
It's like a roulette wheel. They put all their money on black, right? Yeah. And guess what? It it stiffed. And well, we don't understand why it did. You know, it isn't like we didn't like that song because I explained to you. We, we loved every song we put on there. And it sounded very digestible, very accessible, but it didn't catch. And so it was a foregone conclusion then that when we started our tour for Freedom of Choice that this was it, right? You know, uncontrolled, I mean, uh, you know, really wanted failed. They weren't fo gonna follow it with anything. Um, they thought the title track Freedom of Choice was a non-starter, which is also pretty silly. I love that song. I guess song. if Axl Rose covered it, it would have been a number one hit. It's a great <laughs> song. And uh, so we start the tour and we're playing, you know, four and 500 seaters and, you know, cool clubs around America. And this guy named Cal Rudman down in Florida, who was a regional programmer, had quite a lot of power. And he had some Cal Rudman, you know, Monday morning quarterback or report sheet. You know, he, he put out a, as a programmer, he put out this sheet that went out to all the Southeastern United States DJs, to all the stations. But still, there was no like centralized kind of corporate reality like Clearwater. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. DJs had a lot of individual autonomy. Yeah. And people regionally could play what they wanted, you know, in a much better time in America, freedom. Well, Cal, Cal, when Warners had sent him, you know, here's the song, Grill You Want, blah, blah, blah. But they, of course, also send the promotional materials and the record. Cal Rudman was an old style programmer. He didn't just take, you know, you know, uh, payoff money and, and, and drugs. He listened to the record. He actually sat down, listened to Debo's record, and he decided Whip It was an incredible song. So on his own, you know, with no grap from Warner Brothers, uh, no bribes. He started playing Whip It down on a few stations in Florida. And I think up into Georgia. Yeah, at least, I mean, that part of the United States playing Devo, first of all, is ridiculous. Well, it caught the ear of several DJs. And within three weeks, it was in New York City. Once it hit the New York City FM airwaves, we had to stop our tour. We had to reconfigure the whole thing for bigger places. Mm. The, the agent in, in uh, LA, which at the time was William Morris, Wayne Forte or whatever, he, he had to talk to the promoters in several areas. And suddenly we start the tour up again and we're playing like, 2,000 seaters, 3,000 seaters, and 5,000 seaters. And this thing is spreading around America. By the time we're done with our American tour, it's in the charts. It's moving up the charts. And that's when Warner said, you got to do a video, right? Because up until then, they thought, why are you doing videos? Videos are stupid. Why are you yeah. spending your money on making videos, Do you yeah. know? There was no MTV. There was nothing, right? You know, Night Flight might have played them. Uh, there were about maybe a dozen videos at that point. They weren't called music videos. Uh, so on a break before we went to Japan, because Japan had been scheduled for Devo, uh, I shot, you know, the video to whip it in one 16 hour day in our rehearsal studio that we had at the time in a warehouse in LA. And uh, immediately, I think within a month, MTV had three stations in three cities that they started, they broke in, boom. And they started playing with it in these three cities. And it went through the roof. And, uh, and then they got, by 1981, that next beginning of the next year, they they had national franchise with American Express money. 
And so Bob Pittman and John Sykes, who started the company, came to us and said, we need all your videos, man. You know, we're going to make you big stars because now they needed programming. But we can't pay you. <laughs> so they had, you know, we had five videos in the can at that point, including Whippet. And they started playing them all. Yeah. And we, and then Whippet went into the top 10 and it just, that was that. It, Devo exploded. And so, so perhaps without Cal focusing on this song, we would not be having the same conversation today. Yeah, I don't think so. I think, I think I have to say that, you know, this is how things work too. You know, it's so much is chance and luck. Yeah. And serendipity. And no matter how hard you try or how much talent you have or don't have, uh, you, 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 you know, here's 10 people with immense talent. One of them hits because the gods shined, smiled on that person with other things that cannot be quantified. Yeah, if, if it hadn't been for Cal, very possibly nobody else would have picked up the ball. And that would have been our last record. And Devo would be a, a small footnote in new wave history. Pretty amazing. And when that happened, and then we'll get into um, my second song. Yeah. When that happened, did you, and, and you all blew up essentially. So that song, it sounds like that was the song that really transformed your careers. Yes. When that happened, did you feel like, did it feel like it was, well, it must've felt like it was happening, but did it change the dynamics of the band at all and how your process was going forward from a creative standpoint? Unfortunately, it did. Not right away. So that was the fortunate part. Not right away. But, you know, for me, I just felt elated because I had always worked from concepts and plans and ideas so that I felt vindicated. In other words, here, this was the idea. I was working for the idea of Devo to make Devo bigger than any of the individuals so that we could do, we could, you know, even like a good corporation, diversify and do these things we had talked about, movies, you know, uh, soundtracks, a play, you know, this was it. You know, now somebody's gonna take us seriously. We'll have a bigger voice. We can take meetings with more important people and we can get these ideas done that are still just in our heads. Uh, so I was elated because this was vindication. And, and suddenly people were being very nice, doors were opening, you know, uh, could get just about any meeting you wanted. I could get into any restaurant any given night. Yeah. <laughs> they knew us. And, yeah. uh, and so, and I was, and now some money started trickling in from royalties and it was like, oh, wow, look at this. I, you know, I can buy a new car. <laughs> but, I, so, I, I don't have to worry if it runs or not. It's going to run. <laughs> so Devo was never about, it wasn't against being popular in terms of like mass appeal. It, right. But it was more not about me. It was more not about getting, having a platform for you to get your ideas across where your ideas, when you thought about it that way, was it your ideas to entertain? Was it your ideas to make people think? Was it your ideas to actually have a political agenda? What was it? Yes. Well, yes to all that for me, you know, and I thought that was shared by the band, but I think in retrospect, after years have gone by, it really wasn't. But uh, that's, I was the idealist, you know, you know, mark me stupid. I was the guy that was the cheerleader for Devo. And, and yes, uh, my heroes were the bands that were both artistically valid and popular because that's the hardest juxtaposition in the world. It's easy to be artsy and obscure and bum everybody out. And it was easy to create crap that, that was so, you know, dissolute that the next year you couldn't even remember it because it was so bland, right? But I mean, my heroes were the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, you know, uh, uh, the Who, Jimi Hendrix, David Bowie, you know, these guys were artists and they were accessible. They wrote 
great hit songs that have endured the test of time that people still love 40, 50, 60 years later. That's art. That is oh. art. And that is what we see with your music, obviously, which is still resonates as much as it resonated then. And, and you know, you talk about what's so funny about how life works. When you tell the story about Girl You Want, and that's the song that the label really wanted to push, and that it was, it never got its day, but here we are, there was the uh, Girl You Want is the theme song from uh, a big show, MTV show, right? Actually, Uncontrollable Urges. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Ridiculousness. But Ridiculousness. Girl, yes, but Girl You Want also has been in the pop culture. Used a lot, yes. Yeah, it's used a lot. It's used, yeah. used a lot. So then let's let's shift gears a little bit, because uh, because your album Freedom of Choice, like you said, it was it was a transformation of sound. The first two albums were much more guitar driven, and you and I have talked about that a little bit. So uh, you go from that um, from Duty Now to the Future, and very different kind of sound. And I understand that it was an intentional change now to go a different direction. And it's interesting to hear the dynamics of how the label was thinking about it too. But let's go to the song Gut Feeling. Oh, excuse me, not Gut Feeling. Let's go, let's go to the song um, Smart, Smart, Patrol, Patrol. Mr. And yeah. Mr. Smart Patrol, Mr. DNA. Mm -hmm. So that's a song that I chose because uh, as a longtime devotee, I, I, I know your discography, and I just think it's a very interesting song. Uh, I, to me, it captures essence of both electronic, but also the guitars together in a very yeah. interesting mix. So tell yeah. a little bit about that song as well, like how that came to be. And you've done that a, several times in your songs. So like Gut Feeling, Slap Your Mammy. Again, there's another one where you have two different ideas that come together and collide and yet work really well. Yeah, um, you know, uh, my, my biggest regret about Smart Patrol DNA was that when we finally got to record it with Ken Scott, he was the wrong guy. Uh, that song live brings down the house every time. And it has brought down the house for 40 years, every time. And when we recorded it, this guy like poured saltpeter all over the power of that mix. He, he took all the, you know, <laughs> male hormones on that song <laughs> and just to me ruined it. Um, that song deserves a new recording, but live, live, and there's some live recordings of it too that are so powerful. It brought down the house because what that song was all about was very early on, it was my attempt, I wrote, Smart Patrol. And Smart Patrol was not married to Mr. DNA at all. There was no Mr. DNA. And I wrote Smart Patrol in 1975 when we were still practicing at, you know, as an early, early iteration of Devo with Mark Mothersbaugh, Bob Mothersbaugh, and his brother Jim on drums. Only four of us in. Mr. Mother's Ball Sr.'s basement on Zurich Road in Northampton Township in, uh, yeah, in West Akron. And it, the equipment was there because Bob Mother's Ball had a rock and roll band called the Jitters. And we really liked the way Bob played guitar, but we didn't really like the Jitters music. And we convinced him to, um, you know, we convinced him to, uh, play with us, like, hey, try this music with us, please. So he, he agreed to it and he was warming up to it. And we, in 1975, I, I showed everybody this progression in the lyrics to Smart Patrol. And Smart Patrol was my earliest idea of almost creating an alter ego for the band Devo, even though Devo wasn't real yet, mm -hmm. but the Smart Patrol would be this like, alter ego that could be used in a in a play or a film so that we didn't have to be them we could hire actors who would be the smart patrol playing our music and uh and so 
it's a band song, not a name check song, but a band song. Like, you know, one guy sings one verse, then the next guy sings the next verse, then the next guy sings the third verse. And we each, you know, tell the audience and, and proclaim that we're tired of the soup du jour and we want to end this prophylactic tour. And so we're, you know, it's sad, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a lament. And then, boom, the chorus. And now all three of us sing it together. We're the smart patrol, nowhere to go. Suburban robots who monitor reality. So this was like a, um, you know, a kind of a call to arms. Like, here's our terrible condition as blue collar spuds in Akron, Ohio, <laughs> navigating this awful culture that we found our part of, self part of in 1975. And it was awful. And uh, this was like right after, you know, the impeachment of Nixon, you know, this was really nasty stuff. And, and that's where we developed that real group thing where everybody's singing. Some people sing one part, some people sing another part. Then we all come together and sing. Yeah, right. And it's a, it's a round, it's a trade off. Mm -hmm. It's an anthem. And we worked on that. And at first it was, you know, very low energy, <laughs> very protean. And as we, as we got better and better, as we reached critical mass as musicians in a unit that played together, by late 76, we're, we've written a lot more songs and now, and we're playing a few live gigs and we're getting really good live. And we have Alan now as our drummer and we're really firing on all cylinders, reaching that critical mass. And in one of our rehearsals, it was either Mark Mothersbaugh or my brother, Bob Casale, who had joined the band in 1976 early, who started playing that uh, two chord progression. And everybody, you know, and Alan started drumming and it was very punky and very, and we liked it. And Mark had written some lyrics based on this whole, you know, conversation we had ongoing about de-evolution and about the altruistic gene and human beings being important. You know, the only thing that kept us from being total murderers is the altruistic gene. And I had a theory that, you know, Christianity was based on a, a, a anthropomorphization of the altruistic gene. In other words, Jesus was just spouting stuff that represented the altruistic gene in humans that, that drive them to not just be oriented towards themselves selfishly at the, at the expense of their brethren and of their children, you know, that, that they have a sense genetically, you know, predisposed, pre-conscious of just like good animals do, <laughs> of, of trying to save their tribe, their herd, their family. And, uh, you know, we had read about a lot, a lot about DNA and the altruistic gene. So he had written some funny stuff about that, you know, that Mr. Kamikaze, Mr. DNA. So I worked on those lyrics with him and suddenly we had the idea of putting them to this progression and doing another round like Smart Patrol where one guy sings one line, one guy sings the next line, one guy sings the next line and then we sing together. And during rehearsals for live shows, when Alan was going to finish Smart Patrol, I think Bob Casale started playing the progression to Mr. DNA instead of ending the song, just kind of like jamming it together because everybody's energy was up, right? And we all laughed and liked that. And so we started practicing making it a medley because it just seemed like mashing those two up, they were thematically related, they, they complemented each other, it made sense out of the Smart Patrol to sing Mr. DNA. And we practiced that and made it work as a medley. And it's that medley that kick into the, like you think Smart Patrol has wasted you as the audience. And now it kicks up to the next level to a faster BPM and more insanity. And then finishes with the, uh, re reprise of the smart patrol dare dare do 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 the do 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 the figure 
And once we did that a couple times live and the audience went nuts, of course, it, it just became part of our lexicon of live stuff. It's very, and yeah, it is very theatrical. Actually. It is totally theatrical. And it was designed that way. And it was what I had in mind at the time is, you know, for the Devo movie that never happened or the Devo musical that never happened. It will and happen. This, yeah. And that this band called the Smart Patrol is a band that's keeping alive the legacy of Devo who's been suppressed and written out of history. So it's this young, these young guys that refuse to go with the program that are bringing this music to their people like in the future. So that was the idea behind it back in 1975. And it still works today. And people, that, that's a, it, it is like a, um, a standard. It's, I think it's, you know, a part of the set that you cannot eliminate. You can't not do that song. Just like Gut Feeling, that was a standalone song. And then Slap Your Mammy Down, Slap Your Pappy Down, okay. That was just some live thing that my brother and I would do based on a joke because we had grown up in Ohio around hillbillies. <laughs> and one of our cousins would say, you slap your mammy down, you slap your pappy down, like a put down, right? And we remember this and we were laughing about it one day. And then of course, as you know, as satire, we start singing it. And so it got jammed onto the end of, of gut feeling like in similar fashion to uh, Mr. DNA got slammed onto the end of, uh, of Smart Patrol. So between those, between Smart Patrol DNA and gut feeling slap your mammy, that's like a, a 10 minute orgasm live that's just powerful to this day and nonstop. And the audience just goes over the edge. And by the way, I saw that, I saw that at your, that um, show I was ta talking about, your show at Desert Days, yeah. where there was a very strong mix of young people and then people of my era right. um, who were all dancing, wearing the red hats and loving those oh. songs and the energy of them. And so that's why I chose that song because absolutely that is a, you know, that mix together is, is very powerful. And one thing you were talking about, it's interesting when you were talking about DNA and the altruistic genius and the yeah. conversations that you had about de-evolution with Mark. So, and I've looked at, I've read your book about all the ideas that you had growing up, you know, all, all the, the diagrams and the pictures and the art and all of this. So you were all artists from day one, but, you were, your philosophies, your discussions, your, your philosophical outlook was very real, it, it, right? So like when you- uh, Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> it was, I mean, I think de-evolution really started, you know, like, again, it's well-documented, but it started in my graduate school days with my good academic friend, Bob Lewis, who was a poet and a, and a literature major. And uh, we started using the term uh, not even politically, but just philosophically about what we were noting happening to the culture, that we didn't think progress was happening. We saw entropy. We saw things declining. We saw people's critical faculties and ability to reason crumbling in favor of, uh, you know, uh, conformity and, um, you know, tribalism and, and embracing sound bites. And, you know, and, and this, this coincided with the political landscape that was so frightening at the time and the dissolution of the economy. Are we, and, talking, uh, about, are we talking about today or 50 years no, ago? Well, no, we're talking, about, we're talking about now, 45 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and and what, what's happening today, quote, trumps that. What we're dealing with today makes that look like a precursor, like kindergarten version of the assault on reason and truth and democracy now. This is why there's a global push towards fascism, authoritarianism. It, the very reasons that we were talking about, because you have a dumbed down populace who's also in trouble. They just want to keep their little gigs. Maybe they need two different gigs just to make the rent. 
and just to find food and water that isn't totally contaminated. And they've been beaten down and the rest have their head in the sand. And then there's those people that embrace illegitimate authority. They like the strong man because they're weak themselves and that gives them hope. And that's where we're at. And we've seen it in history and we thought we were beyond it, but given human nature, no, it always gets back to square one. The fight for reasonable people to establish liberty is never ending, is never ending. It's, you know, it always only takes a little bit of concentrated goodness to defeat massive evil, but it, it takes, you know, it always, it takes more than you think though. So, and, and we're right back there. So is it that altruistic gene that you believe that does that give you hope? Well, it used to, <laughs> it used to, but it seems like the, to me, it seems like the negative dark side of human nature, you know, like in a Jungian universe, he talked about the shadow and the light. It's the shadow that's winning. Okay, so how do you, how do you and the band beat that back in your own way? Well, you saw what we tried to do and that's what we were doing in our own way because either you do that or you would have joined a radical organization like the Weathermen or something back then and fought the power that way, but you'll, you'll end up dying or in jail. Uh, so we tried to make a creative response that would resonate. And, it, and in fact, with a small group of people, it has lasted over time. Like we did something right that has nothing to do with trends, you know, and withstood the test of time. That's why we're even here. Yeah, absolutely. It absolutely withstands the test of time and continues on and continues to march forward. It is very, it, it is timeless music, uh, which is interesting because it was so very different from music in the 70s. Um, that's timeless in its own way, too. So, Gerald, just to kind of close things up, um, yeah. as you look at the industry today, just forget the industry, as you listen yeah. to the sounds that you believe matter or are worth listening to are there any is there any specific artist or movement or anything that that you feel is is shaking it up in a way that you respect yeah and and i don't know if i'm qualified to comment on that i can tell you that because of what's happened in the industry it becomes much harder to hear anything that might be good because it used to be that there was enough of a conduit there and a, a pipeline that if something was good, everybody heard it. And everybody wasn't in their own bubble, just like they are culturally and politically, where these guys listen to this, these guys listen to this, these people listen to this, and they know where to go for this, but nobody together hears anything. So all I hear is the most kind of bland and popular stuff that rises somewhere to the masses, you know, once in a while, I will hear something, I go, God, that's really good. And I'll try to find out who it is. And it's hard to find, or you'll find out who they are. And then you find out they didn't do anything else. And they broke up. Uh, I don't see a movement. I'm sorry, I don't. And, um, and call me, you know, an old fart. But I think Billy Eilish is way overhyped. Personally, <laughs> I don't really get that. Um, when I, when I think of Fiona Apple, I'm thinking, God, Billy Eilish is like a, you know, a vanilla ice cream cone compared to Fiona Apple, for instance. Um, and, she, and, and by the way, Billy can't sing. It doesn't matter. I mean, that's, that's her thing. But when she did that James Bond theme, somebody should have stopped her from doing that. That was, that was really unfortunate. But I do hear things, and I wish I could name them more now. They're almost always by black artists, I have to say. Um, the last thing that just totally blew me away and made me jealous is now like, what, two or three years old. That's, I know that's really old in, in this landscape. It was uh, Childish Gambino, This Is America. Yeah. The accompanying video. Yeah. And, and I was just like, oh. That's what I should be doing. That's what I should have done. Why didn't I make that video? Why didn't Devo do a song like that? 
that guy was, it was not silly. That was right on the money and very fantastic and very truthful. It was Absolutely, no, no question. So I completely agree. That video was transformation really? in so many ways. Just the art, the, the ideas, the power, the yeah. song. Yeah. All. Yeah. It was, and it was understated. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So for you. So what is next of uh, my last question to you? What's next for Devo? Yeah. Good question. Isn't it? I mean, besides the cutout bins, I don't know. Um, let's just see. Come if, on now. Come on. Not, uh, that's the, well, I mean, let's, let's just see if, if, if at some point people are allowed to get back together and we can play some concerts, right? And what would be the best is if, you know, Mark would get the spirit again and we'd write songs. Or I get this musical off the ground, which I'm trying hard to do. And, and then we write some original material for that musical in addition to using our catalog to drive the narrative. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, look, it seems like such a natural thing to have a, a musical. I, I, it really does. Absolutely. There's a story to be told. No question about it. I can see that. And um, it would be a great way to help bring Broadway back. That's for sure. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, very good. Well, Listen, you know, I, I did get connected to the producer of Jagged Little Pill. And that's up for a lot of awards. He's a really smart guy. Mm -hmm. So there's an inkling, there's an inkling of hope. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. So Gerald, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting. It was very interesting to hear those stories behind the songs and, um, and all those projects like the musical. It's great. It's very optimistic to hear that there may be new Devo songs that may come out at some point in the future. With that's, yes. a good, that's a good yes. thing. That's a great yes. thing. And we will get back to a point where we're going to be able to have live music for sure. 